Welcome, everybody, to a very special episode of America's Public Forum. America's Public Forum uh, is a series of events co-hosted by Braver Angels and good organizational partner friends of ours, including the wonderful magazine, American Purpose. Uh, and uh, the project of the APFs has been to bridge the worlds of thoughtful journalism, thoughtful scholarship, and thoughtful political practice uh, with the world of uh, grassroots, red, blue, cross-class depolarization done by Braver Angels and other friendly organizations in the space. Uh, we see our mission as to bridge divides and bridge worlds, and we are honored to be working with American Purpose and Bill Galston and George Packer today uh, to, uh, to, to open a conversation on some important divides in America. And so I'm honored that uh, Jeff Gedman is, is working with us on this day. So with no further ado, uh, let me pass this over to our wonderful partner, Jeff Gedman. Jeff is the editor of American Purpose and uh, the reason this whole event is happening. So Jeff, uh, thank you for working with us and on to you. Well, well, Luke, thank you very much. So thanks to co-founder Frank Fukuyama, chair of our editorial board, who joins today from the West Coast. Luke, thank you for joining us, Braver Angels. Bill Galston, who is a member of our editorial board, a columnist for the Wall Street Journal, a scholar at the Brookings Institution, and other things too, has kindly agreed to moderate. He'll run us this first 30 minutes in conversation with George Packer. And George Packer, um, let me first hold up. It's so terrible by Zoom. I, I don't do this very well. But here's the book, which was published, pub date this week, on Tuesday, Last Best Hope, America in Crisis and Renewal. Uh, we've read that with pleasure. We read you always in the Atlantic and elsewhere, including very recently the essay for Americas, the essay, Can Civic Education Save Us? And I think that you're speaking to a sweet spot for us. I'll speak for Braver Angels, but certainly for American purpose, what's broken in democracy and how to defend it and how to fix it. So thank you, George. You're running around writing and promoting like crazy at this moment. We're very grateful for your time and Bill for yours to moderate and lead us. And I turn the microphone over to you. Thanks so much, Jeff. And let me exchange, let me extend my own, you know, personal thanks to George for making time for us in book release week, uh, which is sort of like being shot from a cannon and not knowing <laughs> exactly where you're gonna come down. Uh, let me begin at the end of your book where you make a very interesting remark about the book you've written. You say you know, that it was inspired by political pamphlets from other moments, other periods of crisis. So, you know, what is a political pamphlet and what is the current moment of crisis to which this pamphlet in book length uh, represents a response? Well, thank you to American Purpose and Braver Angels and to Bill for having me. It's, it's an honor and I, I share your purpose. So I'm really happy to be able to join you and to talk about the book and um, the ideas that we are all concerned with. And I see Azar Nafisi, I wanna just shout out, welcome to her. Um, I love political pamphlets. It's a kind of neglected form that is more historical than contemporary, but they are short books, really essays, uh, maybe short book length essays that kind of come with a certain urgency. They're like a, almost like a, a poster or an imprecation in the middle of history saying, this is what's happening. This is what we need to do. This is where things are going wrong. This is the danger ahead. They're written for the moment, but they're also written if they're written right to be read in the future. And so there's a bunch of pamphlets I was reading while thinking about this book in the, my trapped quarantine of COVID um, Orwell's The Lion and the Unicorn. I don't know if anyone here has heard of that one. It's, he wrote it during the Blitz. Um, you know, he was, the bombs were falling and he wrote this wonderful book about how Britain needed socialism in order to defeat Hitler. Common Sense is the original American pamphlet. Um, 
Walt Whitman's Democratic Vistas, not very well known. He wrote it just after the Civil War. It's an attempt to call us back to our democratic ideals when he thought things were taking a turn for the materialistic and the crass. Um, Walter Lippmann's uh, Drift and Mastery, uh, written during the Progressive Era. So these are short books that have a literary value, but also an urgent political message. And um, they, they have an ability to kind of boil things down to their essence. They're not scholarly studies. They're not um, speculative philosophy. They're, uh, they, they speak in a direct essayistic voice to the writer's community, to the writer's people. And I wanted to try a book like that the, the last few books I've written took years, lots of reporting and research. This book, I couldn't do any reporting and research because I, like most people, was stuck with COVID. And uh, I thought, well, I'll take advantage of being stuck to read and think and write. What was the crisis? I mean, I started this in October of last year. The crisis was many fold. There was a, a health crisis. There was a racial crisis. There was, above all, a democracy crisis with the election coming, shops boarding up, Americans buying weapons and ammunition in unprecedented numbers, and genuine talk of maybe civil war. It was not uncommon to hear rational people saying, do you think we're going to see something like a civil war as a result of this election? Fortunately, it hasn't quite reached that point, although January 6th was one of the darker days of my life. Um, I wanted to address that crisis in the middle of it. How did these things come about? What, are, what is it like today? To, I just wanted to describe it, but also how, what are the deeper sources of it going back maybe 40 or 50 years? And finally, what do we do? And, and, and are there any historical precedents for what we do? So I look back to a few historical periods of near death, the Civil War, the Great Depression, the 60s, when Americans thought we were committing some kind of suicide, which is a recurring uh, nightmare in American history. So that's the, uh, the context for writing this book and the kind of book I wanted to write. Well, thanks, George. And that is the perfect setup for my next question. Uh, this, is, this is a book that has a story to tell. I mean, you offer a narrative of where we were, let's say 50 or 60 years ago and where we are now and how we got from there to here. And I wonder whether you would walk us through that narrative because I think the story you tell is really at the heart of what you think about our current crisis and how you think we can get out of it. So in a way, this is picking up on a previous book, The Unwinding, which was more of narrative. It was journalism. It was immersion in the lives of Americans, but looking at the same period from the point of view of, of basically ordinary Americans struggling during this, this decades-long epic. Now I'm in a more essayistic mode. I would say there's never been a single narrative about what America is or should be. There's always competition between different narratives. When I was a little kid, I would say there were two basic narratives of what Richard Rorty calls our moral identity. One was on the democratic side of the ledger. It was the fair shake. It was kind of premised on social solidarity. For a long time, it left out many, many Americans. By the 60s, it had begun to become inclusive of black Americans when the Democratic Party finally turned its back on Jim Crow. On the other side, getting ahead, which is the, the narrative of individual enterprise and, uh, and, and business. And that was the Republican narrative. And those two narratives um, were in competition, but essentially over a, a recognizably similar country. At least that's how I understand the history of that post-war period. Beginning in the late 60s and early 70s, those two disintegrated and were replaced by the four narratives that I describe in the book, which kind of are sequential. They have their turn, each has its turn. Um, the first I describe I call free America, which to me is Reagan's America. It's the America of uh, this, this shining city on the hill. It's the, the narrative of low taxes, deregulation, let business uh, operate free of the heavy hand of government. 
limit government to some basic functions and we'll have shared widespread prosperity and freedom. That was the most powerful of the four during most of my adult life. And it really set the terms for, um, for political debate for maybe 30 years or even more. Smart America is adjacent to free America. It is, has some similar, it accepts some of the same terms. Um, a, an individualistic approach to, uh, to, to social conditions, a sense that you should be allowed to go as far as your talents and effort will take you. Um, uh, an openness to free trade, to immigration, and to globalization. It's sort of the narrative that became predominant in the 90s uh, under Bill Clinton. And I, the key to it is education. Education as the answer to social conflict, social problems. Um, it's the narrative of the meritocracy. It's the smart America is the America I live in and have lived in you know, most of my life. Um, the other two are rebellions against these first two. These first two are kind of the dominant elite narratives at the, in, in a way at the top of the two parties, free America, the Republican party, smart America, the Democratic party with some overlap and then some conflict. But as they began to fail, as prosperity did not become shared and widespread, as globalization seemed to leave out larger and larger numbers of people, the rebellions began. And on the side of the Republican party, what I call real America um, was a sort of mutiny against the, um, the broken promises of, of Reagan's America. It didn't directly address Reagan's America. Instead, it turned its anger on other groups, the elites, the coastal liberals, um, the non-whites, the immigrants. It's, it really was under Sarah Palin's brief turn in the spotlight that I became aware of real America as a powerful political and social force. She used the phrase real America in a, um, in a talk to donors. And it seems to be only in front of donors that presidential and vice presidential candidates tell the truth. Um, real America was said in front of donors. Uh, Barack Obama used that the famous phrase about guns and religion in front of donors. Mitt Romney talked about the 47% who were takers in front of donors. And Hillary Clinton talked about the deplorables in front of donors. So it, if you wanna know what candidates really think, that's where you have to try to listen in if you're allowed. Um, real America, it became Trump's America, the white Christian heartland. It's, a, it's an old identity. It goes back, I would say to Jackson. Um, it's populist. It, it includes William Jennings Bryan's producing masses, uh, Huey Long's Little Man, and George Wallace's uh, more vitriolic populism. There's a line between all of those figures from our history and Palin and on to Trump, who brought it to the highest level of our politics. Uh, and even though he governed really his policies were pretty sympathetic with free American orthodoxy, the tax bill above all. His rhetoric and the way he changed the terms of politics were very much hostile to that. And it, it, he introduced something new. He introduced ethno-nationalism um, and blood and soil. He trashed democracy routinely and managed to keep his supporters on board. So this is something for me that was new in at the top of American politics. And finally, just America is another rebellion by an angry next generation that looked at their parents, the meritocrats, who promised that as long as you worked hard and got into the right schools and got into the right professions, you would have a successful life. And they decided that was either an inauthentic and hollow promise or a, a failed promise and um, began to describe the country in terms not of gradual progress and incremental um, inclusiveness, the terms that Barack Obama always used, the more perfect union. Instead, they described the country as a caste system that is fundamentally the same because the same groups are oppressing 
the same groups as we've always had in our history. There's really been very little change in American history. There's a kind of permanent caste structure to our history, uh, which is goes under the term structural racism and other terms. And it's a millennial narrative. It's a younger narrative. And it's quite powerful in our culture right now and becoming more powerful, I'd say, in politics in the Democratic Party. And it's also a rebellion against another against smart America. It's a kind of intra-family fight between one generation and, and the next. And it's the one that I sort of feel most closely to me because I feel it coming at me all the time. I'm sort of locked into a perpetual struggle with this. I'm trying to understand it. I'm trying to sympathize with it. And I'm also trying to fight it because there's a lot about it I don't like. Those are the four narratives that I lay out as being kind of the dominant ones of the last half century. Before we move from the diagnosis to the cure, George, uh, I'd like to, you know, I'd like to play back to you, you know, something you said at the end of this narrative of the four Americas. I don't have the quote exactly in my head, but you said, you know, in essence, that you don't want to live in any of these Americas. Uh, and they, you know, and the unspoken presumption of the book, I think, is that there are tens of millions of Americans who share your dislike for the four Americas that you've put on the table. Uh, and, uh, you know, I don't know, I don't know how to put a number on it, but it's big enough to make the difference between where we are and where we could be. If the people who say no to all, all four but don't know what to say yes to find something to get yet to say yes to. So I think you're speaking for more than yourself. I absolutely agree. And I should have said these narratives are not um, a demographic overview of the country. I'm not painting a portrait of all of us. I'm trying to describe the dominant narratives, which by definition leave a lot of people out. And you're absolutely right that. A lot of people don't like them, feel bullied by them or dissatisfied with them. Um, there's a sense I think in which political and media elites are using these narratives divisively for their own purposes. I see it over and over again, just cases of where a, something that doesn't need to be a dividing line is made a dividing line because it serves somebody's purpose. And I think a, lo a lot of Americans feel, why are you doing this to us? Why, what is to be gained by dividing us up into tribes and setting those tribes against each other as existential enemies, which is how politics feels to a lot of Americans today. Obviously there's deep divisions that are real and some of them are insuperable, but the sense that we, all have to have some common ground in order to solve any problems has disappeared from a lot of political and media discourse. So one thing I try to do in the book is describe an American identity that I think can encompass us all. We, you know, we are so divided both racially and regionally and in terms of class and education that we don't, we, we, you know, we fixate on that and really begin to imagine we're not of the same country. But when you talk to a foreigner, that foreigner might say to you, you are all so much more like each other than any of you are like us. There are some American cultural, national characteristics that I want to hold on to because they may be right now the only ligaments that are not yet broken. Um, and to me, they all come down to what Tocqueville called, or most of them, I shouldn't say all, but a lot of them point to what Tocqueville called the passion for equality, which he thought was the most distinct feature of American life. Coming from aristocratic France, he thought the desire to be as good as everyone else, to have access to everything, to have the same opportunities, the same status, the same rights as everyone else, Obviously, as a goal, it's something we have failed at throughout our history. But as a passion, Tocqueville saw it as the, I think he called it the uh, ardent and eternal desire of Americans. I think that still holds. It explains so many things about our national identity, our openness and directness, our cluelessness about societies with 
subtle gradations and and ranks our um, the, the ease with which we make friends and perhaps the shallowness of our friendships to some degree, the uh, our loud voices, our casualness with waiters, um, and even our violence, I think, has something to do with this. The, how quickly we feel as if our equal status is being affronted. Um, so I look to e that passion for equality as the 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 code that has to be answered if we're to have a sense of shared citizenship, which is necessary for self-government. Self-government, which I think we have failed at, deteriorates when large groups of Americans feel as if they're locked out of equality with others. And that is true in many different, you can cut it a lot of different ways today. So I think equality and self-government are connected deeply in this country. And so I want to remind us of that national character as a way to begin to talk about how we could um, become a country again. So this brings us to the, the final phase of this opening conversation. Uh, spend, we're going to spend the last five to seven minutes looking in greater detail at your prescription. I mean, echoing the, the narrative of the four Americas, you offer a fifth, which is equal America. And as I, you know, as I read you, uh, this means taking two things much more seriously than we have for quite a while. Number one is equality of opportunity, not equality of results, but genuine equality of opportunity. And number two is recapturing an understanding of regaining the skill and art of, you know, what you call the art of self-government. Would you say just a little bit more under those two headings before we turn to the questions from the floor? You've got it, Bill. That's exactly the way I see it. Um, and you're right to make that distinction between equal opportunity and equal results. Equal results has never been a guiding um, idea in American life uh, that, that has persuaded large numbers of Americans. What, what Americans have clung to is the idea of equal opportunity. But equal opportunity means not living in a society where the results are almost foreordained by where you're born and to whom and what you look like and where you go to school. I mean, here's where I'm probably not gonna be able to live up to the goals I set because I'm not a policy thinker. There, there are policy minds at this conversation who are, are much more knowledgeable about this than I am. These are not my ideas. These are ideas in the air that I think could be useful for, um, for those two goals of creating genuine equal opportunity and acquiring or relearning the art of self-government, which Tocqueville said is not, is not natural. It's something you have to learn and relearn and can forget and lose. And I think that's what's happened. So I think for equality, we need a social safety net that, that allows people to act as citizens. Walter Lippmann said, you cannot expect civic virtue from a disenfranchised class. So if we want Americans to be citizens and to act as citizens, they have to have some basic uh, line under which they don't fall or else they're gonna simply be consumed with surviving from day to day, which is true for a lot of Americans. So what do we need to do to restore uh, a shredded safety net? How can we empower workers who've lost so much power over the last half century uh, while well, you know, maybe unions as we've known them are not gonna come back, but some form of worker power I think is essential. Um, so is uh, the use of government to make sure monopolies don't crush competition and um, take away the freedom of workers because that's an old idea in American history going back to Brandeis and uh, Francis Perkins and even Wilson that um, monopoly is a threat to self-government because it takes away the ability of ordinary people to control their own economic fate enough to act as citizens. So the, this is how self-government is always tied into the, uh, to equality. And on the side of self-government, um, and one more thing about equality, I think schools are this, probably the essence of this. And one thing that 
is strikes me as being so uniquely American is that we pay for our schools mainly but with local taxes and that just builds in an inequality that is, that we've just all live with all the time but which I think is just a permanent barrier for um, for millions of Americans to have a chance on the side of self-government, I wrote a piece for the Atlantic about civics education, which uh, you mentioned, or which Jeff mentioned. Um, I started looking into civics, and I know there have been efforts in the past to bring a curriculum, a national curriculum. They failed because left and right got into a culture war over the details. There's a new uh, group um, called, I think, Educating for American Democracy that's produced a report that proposes not a set of facts to teach, but more like a set of habits to teach. And this is back to Tocqueville, habits of the heart. We need to learn again how to debate each other, how to argue, how to listen, how to compromise, how to persuade. These are things that social media and our, our daily lives, which are so siloed now, have, have deprived us of. So school is the obvious place to do that. Civics or American history is the obvious place. I don't want to have to choose between the 1619 project and the 1776 report. That to me is a sterile argument that is now consuming uh, a lot of people in the media. Rather, what we need to do is not teach our children what to think, but how to think and how to think as self-governing people. And the other idea, again, not original at all, is national service, which the more I think about it, the more obvious it is that if we required our young people to spend a year or two serving the country in military or non-military ways, they would have to work together with other Americans from vastly different backgrounds. They would have an experience they're never going to have at any other moment in their lives. And it could make a difference across one generation after the next um, and it would also remind them of what they owe the country as well as what they want from it. Patriotism is something that the left doesn't like to talk about and the right likes to claim a monopoly on. But I think of patriotism, first of all, as a, a basic feeling that you can't summon on command. You feel it or you don't, but it's like loyalty to your family. It's a, it's a basic human attachment to the place where you live. It's also necessary for any national project. If you don't have national solidarity and a ability to bring along large numbers of countrymen and to feel a sense of attachment with them, you're not going to save democracy. You're not going to slow down climate change or reverse inequality or end racism. You can't do it simply by berating or by protesting or by um, shaking a finger and telling people uh, that they're wrong and immoral. You have to find a kind of glue which patriotism provides. So national service might go some ways toward doing that. Those are a few ideas. I know they're not original. I know that each one in some ways is not fully satisfactory, but I'd like, I wanted really just to point us in, in the direction of equality and self-government and let others add what they want to the conversation. But that's where I think we need to go. Well, that's terrific, George. In 25 crisp minutes, you've answered the three essential questions, namely, what is the nature of the crisis? How did we get here? And how you think we can get out? Uh, and with that, I will retire from the moderator's role and turn the question and answer period over to Jeff Gedman. I know I can tell because I've been seeing the texts pop up that there are a lot of questions already. Uh, Thanks, this is Bill. a large audience. Uh, so, Jeff, over to you. Bill, thank you, and well done, both of you. I'm going to read the first one, George, from colleague Caroline. You started here, but dig a little deeper for us. She asks about the U.S. tax code and the American passion for equality. And I'm going to add a footnote to her question because you and Bill just addressed the issue of equality of opportunity versus equality of outcome. Christine Emba, the young columnist of the Washington Post, who has been with us, I was going to say on the show, in, this, in these Zoom discussions, uh, wrote a piece last week under the title, Is It Time to Limit Personal Wealth? 
So have at that a little bit, if you would. To impose like an absolute ceiling beyond which your wealth will be confiscated, is that? Sort of well, the I'll let he, her column speak for itself. And I, I, would, uh, I wouldn't use the word absolute, but is it to be navigated because of what is seen now as excessive wealth at, right. in times of turmoil? This gets to the passion for equality because Tocqueville writes that that passion is the direct cause of our individualism. In other words, we all want to have the full range of opportunities that everyone else has. That means the links between us are broken. He says the aristocracies put everyone in a long chain with links between them and democracy breaks those links, which threatens us with extreme individualism. So the flip side of equality is individualism, which leads to inequality in an obvious way. So in a, in a way, equality is not an absolute uh, virtue. It can be a threat to democracy as well. And I would say Americans have never, by and large, said people should not be allowed to get rich. That would violate the passion for equality in, an, in a paradoxical way. What Americans have mostly said is there should not be special privileges, um, special classes that to, to which entry is barred. Um, and today there are special classes to which entry is barred. And I think we should change policies that open entry. I don't think capping wealth would do that. I think taxing wealth might help. I, I would make a distinction between those two. I know people question whether it's constitutional or not, but it's an idea that to me, given that the income tax code means that Jeff Bezos doesn't have to pay any income tax, which we learned from ProPublica last week, Jeff Bezos and many other billionaires, um, that's an affront to the passion for equality. That does not seem like the American idea of equality. And I think there was widespread outrage because it just seemed so unequal, so unfair. How else do you get it, their vast wealth and make sure that they pay their fair share? Well, maybe by taxing it as wealth rather than as income. So I, I don't think a cap, a cap would violate, I think that American sense that individual effort should be rewarded. Um, but the tax code is so obviously skewed toward the wealthy now and toward the well-connected, that it's made Americans of all kinds, right and left, cynical about government um, and cynical about Congress as a bought institution. And I think we have to make some pretty big changes in order to, uh, to return Congress and the tax code to the mass of Americans. Thank you, George. I'm gonna call now on Arvind Bal, if you could identify yourself. Please to Arvind and everybody, be succinct, as succinct as you can in courtesy to others because time is racing. And Arvind, I'll just mention to the group and the gallery that you have a piece coming up with us on how the center-right, how the GOP might be able to forge, create a coalition of, I think as you put it, uh, forces rooted in liberal, constitutional and market values. Arvin, over to you, please. Hey, thanks for the, the kind words, Jeff. Uh, so I really enjoyed your, your piece uh, very much, George. One of the best pieces I read this year. There's one thing I kind of take issue with uh, is that you did a great job in your Just America uh, narrative and explaining it, but you didn't sort of explain how the Just America ideas have strengthened the real America narrative, right? And you see some of the things like, you know, I think Jeff pointed this out in his article on Karapia in the Washington Post. I mean, some of the language directed towards certain people in this country, uh, like Sarah Jong, the New York Times saying that, you know, white people should be canceled, stuff that Andrew Sullivan called eliminationist language, uh, you know, Laurie Lightfoot saying she wouldn't give interviews to, to white folks, which just happened at Yale, where, where a psychiatrist said, you know, kind of wanting, you know, wanted to kill white people. Uh, so, you know, this kind of kulakization sort of strengthens the narrative, and this is the one issue, I've seen a lot of articles by left-leaning people on explaining Trump, and they always do this sort of real America, blood and soil kind of stuff as, as coming from, you know, free trade and Reaganite capitalism and being fearful of diversity, and I've always felt, you know, identity politics breeds identity politics, extremism breeds extremism, you know, the loop has to be broken somehow, and then just really quickly 
you made one mention in your column that uh, the average protester was somebody making a hundred thousand and well educated, uh, or or those people were overrepresented. Then overrepresented, not the average, but overrepresented. Um, but you you kind of went down a few lines and said you know, a lot of the a lot of the just America uh, advocates are people who are highly educated, but kind of you know haven't haven't had the opportunities uh, they would have expected. And in any country historically. You know, we have a populace that's very highly educated and, and, and scholarly, but can't get jobs that promotes radicalism. So which, which is it? Is it more the winners of society, uh, idealistic winners of society protesting, or is it more the people who are highly educated, but they can't, uh, you know, they kind of aren't able to sort of capitalize on it? Hey, Arvind, before George answers, I'm not going to give you an A on being succinct, but it was a very good question. Sorry about you, that. You did not tell us who you are. I know others may not. Okay, uh, you know, my name is Arvin Ball. Uh, you know, I'm somebody who's worked in the financial sector most of my career, but uh, also the author of, uh, you know, From Jinnah to Jihad, Pakistan's Kashmir Quest and the Limits of Realism. It's a book on, on the India-Pakistan conflict uh, over Kashmir, and I'm a term member on the Council of Foreign Relations. Arvin, thank you. George, over to you. Well, so the first thing you raised was the connection between just and real America. Yeah. I think there's an intimate connection. I actually do talk about it in the book, how they've both uh, in some ways become disillusioned with the enlightenment and with liberal the liberal values that um, we want to believe inform the founding of the, of the country. They both don't, they, they don't accept the premise that America is you know, the land of immigrants, of equal opportunity, of, of uh, an embrace of all people, that there's a universal value to our democracy that doesn't see uh, people in terms of group, but rather as individuals. So they both reject that in different ways. And it shows a kind of generational disillusionment with, uh, with both free and smart America, both of which are based in liberalism. They just have different emphases on it. Um, and the, the other part of it, um, the question of who are the just Americans, I guess is what you're asking. No, um, I meant more specifically on the protesters. Like, did you yeah. have a citation for that one hundred thousand? Uh, yeah, there, there was a there's a um, a study done by Civis Analytics, I guess you would pronounce it, that has vast polling data on who were the who was in in the streets in June of 2020, and it just right. struck me that if you look at well educated okay. college or graduate school and well compensated, over 100,000. They really are well overrepresented. Sure. They are certainly not the average, but it was striking that the image I expected was of young people, certainly, but young people maybe more in the working classes, young people yeah. you know, making 30 or 40,000 a year. That was, not the, that was not the disproportionately large group. Was so- yeah, were there a lot of people who like had PhDs but were you know you know maybe struggling in terms of getting positions like people who are highly highly educated but maybe not so financially successful because those people yeah. are often the the basis for any radical movement. Yeah, this world. is this is the historian Peter Turchin's phrase, the overproduction of elites, which I refer to in my book, that instability in history is often generated by a class that is overeducated but cannot find. Uh, a stable place in, in society and in the economy. And they, you, you could actually look at the Iranian revolution. I think maybe Azar has something to say about this. It's, these are cases of rising expectations. These are not the wretched of the earth. They're classes that are actually seeing, you know, their educations improve, but are not seeing the full reward that they expect. And they turn quite fiercely on than the generation before them as blocking their way or as somehow uh, you know, poisoning the well for them. And that's why the generational fight between just and smart America is so intense and why so many leaders of smart America, whether it's editors at the New York Times or uh, editors of literary magazines or leaders of scientific institutes are so quick to abdicate when they come under pressure from just America. We've seen case after case after case. It's as if there is no solid base of values to defend their institutions because they might, they, they seem to recognize that, they, that there's a hollowness that they can't defend. And maybe they're also just trying to hang on to for dear life to their own seats 
But um, what I see over and over in my own world of the media is people of my generation giving in sometimes wisely and rightly, but often in panic to the, the moral demands of the next generation, which might not always be uh, in the service of real morality, but might actually be more of an expression of power. No, oh, thank you both. Thank you, Arvind. Thank you, George. I wanna call on Seema May Heath. If I've mispronounced your name, apologies, do correct me. If you're still there, and you can hear me, you have the floor and tell us who you are. Oh, well, thank you. Um, I didn't expect to be called on, but I'm ready. I am Sienna May Heath. I am a purple member of Braver Angels. Um, so not quite red, not quite blue. And as a writer, I've really been navigating the tension between free America and just America. So last year, as some of you may know, um, a group of prominent writers and educators, including Margaret Atwood, Noam Chomsky, and Salman Rushdie, penned a letter on justice and open debate in Harper's Magazine. And um, just a quick excerpt, which I think really captures the tension between free America and just America. Um, they wrote, the way to defeat bad ideas is by exposure, argument, and persuasion not by trying to silence or wish them away. We refuse any false choice between justice and freedom, which cannot exist without the other. As writers, we need a culture that leaves us room for experimentation, risk-taking, and even mistakes. My questions are, what tensions do you see between free America and just America particularly within the realms of media and higher ed? And what is the role of writers and educators in navigating these tensions to encourage greater unity? Thanks for the question. I actually wrote some of those words. I was um, one of the authors of the, the Harper's letter. Oh, um, wow. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm braced for regret here, but actually I hear those words and I, I can accept them a year later. They don't, they sound right to me. Um, well, that's a huge question for our moment because uh, so many of the battles in our culture seem to be about whether language and ideas are some are legitimate. I wouldn't put it quite as free America, which I think of as more like a economic libertarianism, but maybe free and smart America, both based in liberal values. But whether um, language and ideas are a form of expression, which democracy needs in order to arrive at truth, which is always provisional and always subject to challenge by other language and other ideas, or whether they are forms of power, which um, have always been used to keep one group in, in power over another, to keep an oppressor group in power over an oppressed. And that is an idea a notion that has really taken hold among younger people. Um, I think it comes out of universities. It comes out of humanities programs. Uh, in fact, I was in college a long time ago, but it was already beginning to emerge in comp, comp lit and uh, philosophy. And now it's become the instincts, I would say. D.H. Lawrence said the ideas of one generation become the instincts of the next. I think these are now the instincts of a lot of young people coming out of universities. It's in the air around them to say, that speech hurts me, that leaves me out. I don't recognize myself. You haven't represented me, you haven't included me. And so in one way or another, you can't do that. You can't say that. It's a really powerful argument um, and it's, hard to, it's hard to answer absolutely, because obviously there is some speech that does dehumanize and that does uh, essentially tell people you're not welcome here. You're gonna hear things that will make you feel as if your humanity has been disregarded. The problem is the instinct has spread so wide that it now includes entirely legitimate and humane and respectful debate. For example, 
the editor of the Journal of the American Medical Association was recently forced to step down, not for anything he said or, or wrote, but for something someone else connected to the magazine said on a podcast of the magazine. And what, what did he say? He said that socioeconomic conditions are more important than structural racism in keeping disadvantaged groups disadvantaged. This is an argument that social scientists have been having for a long time. William Julius Wilson was a big voice in this argument a generation or two ago, but now you can't even mention it. That's just a fatal turn away from liberal values and it will fail. It will fail us for two reasons. One, because it will alienate all kinds of people whose common sense tells them that you just can't be telling people, you can't be putting mental and verbal straitjackets on people and expect them to want to stay in the room with you. It does not have any kind of political appeal beyond, I think, a very narrow group. And second, it doesn't arrive at policy answers because it has to ignore arguments and data that might lead in the right direction. It cannot look at certain things. It can't talk about certain things. Uh, and I see this everywhere too. I see it in coverage of crime and of education and the way the media has really become a player in the narrative that will not allow uh, experts to say certain things that might sound rather sharp and hard to hear, but that are necessary to hear because they describe reality. So uh, the Harper's letter was a crucial project for me and my co-writers because what we saw around us in the middle of entirely legitimate protests was the protest taking a turn, certain parts of the protest taking a turn that I thought was terrible for, for democracy. And we wanted to try to steer it back. And then we got quite a lot of blowback as well as some, uh, some positive feedback. It showed me though how far some younger people especially have gone in this direction of hostility to, to free expression. So thank you both for that exchange. Here's what I'd like to do. Believe it or not, it is eight minutes before the hour. How did that happen? Let me try to bundle three together. That's Matt Hansen and Manuel Gwen Kinsler. It works if each of you are one minute or less. If you can do it in 30 seconds, I don't know. I'll wash your car and walk your dog. Matt Hansen, can you set the standard here? Sure, I'll try. Um, <clears throat> So um, just to make a very long story short, I, the question that, I'm, that I have uh, for you, George, and that I'm really curious about in general, I see it nationally, I see it in day-to-day -day life. What happens when the right, defined in this term by Trump supporters, the, the, the Trump uh, crew, say, you can't tell me that the election wasn't stolen or that it wasn't rigged. If you're doing that, you're insulting me and you're not hearing me and I'm being silenced, however you want to phrase it, bullied, condescended to. Um, the idea of being silenced and marginalized was generally kind of a, a left wing thing, I would say. And then now I feel like that's been adopted by the right. And this is, I think, in the essay where you're talking about the different uh, parts of America weaving in and out of each other. So I'd love to get your take on that. You're absolutely Matt, thank right. you, George. Hold your fire for one, if you would, just for one second. I do want to say Matt Hansen is a teacher, is a writer, contributing editor to American Purpose. Okay. Could we get Anne Manuel in, please? <clears throat> if Anne is not there available, oh, could we yeah, get I, Oh, yeah, Anne, go ahead. I don't have my hand up. I'm, I'm not sure why you're calling on me. I just put that in the chat. So please go to someone else. Uh, understood. I saw you in the chat. I thought it was a question for George. Gwen Kinsler, was your comment just for everybody in chat or did you have a question to pose? I'm sorry, I didn't raise my hand. I'm, I don't have anything to say. Quite all right. I saw you in chat. My mistake. Matt Hansen's question. George, over to you. Yeah, it's a great question, um, Matt. Thank you for it. I mean, when we wrote the Harper's letter, we, had, we began it by saying the cancellor in chief is Donald Trump. Cancel culture. This is a phrase I don't use and we didn't use in the letter. It's just become meaningless. But for shorthand in this conversation, uh, it exists on the right at least as much as on the left. And that is 
partly how discipline has been maintained on the right, great discipline in the Republican Party, among Republican voters, in Republican media, Fox News, absolute uh, intolerance to the point of hounding into silence uh, contrary ideas. So don't think because the Harper's letter was directed mostly to the left that it ignored the right. It kind of took for granted that the people who signed that letter, and I think some of them might be here today, um, knew that there is such a thing as hostility to open debate on the right. In fact, it almost defines the right. It almost defines the, uh, the, the administration of Donald Trump. And left and right learn from each other. And now we have the right using phrases like uh, harmful speech or marginalized or you know, disenfranchised or decentered. The language that came out of the academic left is now in universal use. Um, and it is, it is at least as invidious on the right as on the left. Um, the left uses it in the name of social justice. The right uses it in the name of, I would say, a defense of authoritarianism. Even if the social justice has authoritarian strains, it still originates, I think, in totally legitimate uh, liberal values. It just violates them along the way, whereas the right's use of it is authoritarian and has nothing in common with the kind of America that that I want to live in. So it's a it's become a really widespread problem. But it does show you that the left plays with fire when it introduces these kinds of um, repressive notions. One example is there are now state legislatures around the country banning the teaching of critical race theory or even of negative views of America, which is a preposterous and probably unconstitutional thing for them to do. Um, but they are in some ways reacting to what is an orthodoxy and dogma on the left that is being imposed in schools. I've seen it in my own son's education. I've written about that and I see it more and more now in, in other school districts in other states. It's becoming more widespread that a certain race orthodoxy is now being imposed on very young children. So it's not as though the right has nothing to be upset about, but then they respond to it using left-wing language, language that originated in the left in order to suppress uh, free expression. It's unacceptable on both sides. So, What do you think uh, should be done about it? I'm sorry, I don't mean to piggyback, but what do you think can be done about that? Matt, Matt I'm not gonna let you piggyback oh. because you've broken the rules. You're no longer a contributing editor at American no. Purpose. My God, what are you doing, man? So, sorry, I'm rude, but I am watching the clock and we are very committed to keeping everybody as a courtesy on time. Sorry about that, Matt, I'm just joking. Um, I'd like to do the following. I'd like to thank, it's two minutes before the hour, 1 p.m. Eastern. So I wanna thank Luke Nathan Phillips at Braver Angels. I wanna thank everybody, uh, 300 or so registered from across the United States, also friends from abroad, Europe and elsewhere. I wanna thank Bill Galston, for moderating and George Packer for engaging with us. And I'd like to say, Bill, you would have the penultimate word and then final thoughts over to you, George. Bill? Well, you know, we have, let, we have left a lot of unexplored questions out of, out of this conversation. Uh, I think one of, the, one of the big ones lingering for me came up tangentially in a couple of the questions, namely how we conjure with the balance in our thinking between the economic developments of the past half century and the cultural developments of the half, half, past half century. Is one set reducible to the other, or are we dealing with two independent narratives here that need to be disentangled in some future conversations? Of course, I, I incline uh, to the latter view, uh, and uh, I hope we have a chance to explore that important question in our future conversations. Hey, Bill, thank you very much. And to you, George, last best hope America in crisis and renewal, congratulations, brand new. I hold it up again. 
read it. It's a pleasure. And you and now, George, guest of honor, have any final thoughts for us, please? First of all, I'm so glad American Purpose and Braver Angels are doing what you're doing. Uh, I've been following from afar. And now that I've been part of a discussion, I can see how good it is, how rich it is, and how many of you there are, which is really heartening because sometimes it feels when I'm just sending a little essay out into the, the void of the internet from the Atlantic mothership uh, and getting generally a barrage of of, of hate more than of love. It's just great to know that there are so many people who genuinely are trying to find a way to stake out um, a ground in which Americans can talk to each other as equal Americans without killing each other. And that seems to be like the basic purpose that you're pursuing. And I, I really am glad that, that you're doing it. Well, George, thank you. And again, to everybody, if you're inclined and in a position to do so, turn on your camera just for a moment to say hello and goodbye to everybody from different cities across the country and places abroad. Thank you all, thank you all. And Bill, beautifully done. And George, big congratulations. We really appreciate your time. Thank you all. Thanks, Stay safe, everybody. have a good weekend. Thank you.